All right, so we're just coming off of an AP day on 5-3 and 5-4. So 5-3 and 5-4, those are big deals on the AP test for sure. 5-5 five, five is a very, very, very big deal. I've never seen an AP test that didn't have a whole problem focusing on this stuff. All right, so no pressure, no big deal. Um, but it's definitely very important that we know this stuff. So we're going to do a whole AP day on just 5-5 five, five, uh, AP problems in our next class. So I'm going to start you guys off with an easy example, just like a nice constant rate. So let's say water is flowing into an empty bucket at a constant rate of 2 gallons per second. We want to know how much water is in the bucket after 4 seconds. Okay, so like I said, I'm giving you a very easy one. It's like this velocity one that I gave you when we started the chapter out. It's purposely easy so that we can kind of set up what the graph would look like and kind of model how we would deal with similar situations when the rate isn't constant. Okay, so we know for sure that it's going to be 8 gallons. I mean, that part is easy. It's going in at 2 gallons per second, and we're talking about 4 seconds here. However, we did the same thing with velocity, too. If we look at a time graph versus the rates, the rate is a constant 2 gallons per second. So if we do 1, 2, 3, 4 seconds, we're looking at this rate function, and what we end up doing is just taking the area under the curve from 0 to 4. It's a nice rectangle, it's a 2 by 4 rectangle, it ends up giving us 8 gallons. And even if we compare the units, gallons per second times seconds ends up just giving us gallons. So, like we're talking about right now, this is just the definite integral of R of t over this interval. And remember, a definite integral represents area under a curve. So we use R of t as our function in the area under it from 0 to 4. And so that's exactly what I'm going to write down here, the area from 0 to 4 under the function 2, which is just a constant, you know, horizontal line. So that's what's represented by this right here. We know by looking at constant integrals like this that we're just going to get a rectangle. And so, like I said, I'm purposely starting you off with an easy, an ex easy example so we can use this in the future for when we have much more complicated rates. And by the future, I mean about two minutes. So let's say the flow rate varies continuously. Let's say it's kind of an up and down function. It's not something that's just nice and constant. And it goes from an interval, let's call it T1 to T2. We want to set this up in kind of generic form so we have a nice formula to deal with. Then the quantity of water is equal to the area under R of T from T1 to T2. Okay, so that's the general idea. If you're trying to figure out the total amount of water, you integrate the area function from T1 to T2. The reason this works out, okay, if we say, let's say S of T is the amount of water. The amount of water at time T Okay, so we're going to use S as the amount. R is the rate, S is the amount. We're going to show how these two are connected. Then, here's what we know. The rate is actually S prime, right? The rate is actually S prime. It's the derivative of the amount. That's how we get the rate. So if S is the amount, R is the rate, then the rate is equal to the derivative of S. Kind of like, let's consider this to be position and this to be velocity. The velocity is the derivative of position, right? So we know that that relationship is true. So, if R is the derivative of position, I'm sorry, the amount, that means the amount is the integral of the rates. Okay, so those relationships kind of go back and forth. So again, let's go back to position and velocity. If velocity is the derivative of position, that means position is the antiderivative of velocity. Okay, so that's what we're trying to figure out here. If we take the antiderivative, and we can throw in like a t1 to t2, because we know that we're normally talking about area, so we have the definite integral. That should make sense based on this. The area under r of t from t1 to t2 gives us the total amount. All right, so that's kind of our explanation for that. Um, what we say for this, the quantity, T2 minus T1, so this is the amount at T2 minus the amount at T1, it's called the net change. The net change in S of T, whatever the amount is,
Nope, that was supposed to be like a one and then a comma and they all got mixed together there, sorry. Okay, so like the water for instance. This is the amount of water after four seconds minus the amount of water after zero seconds. And we said it was an empty bucket. So the net change is just the eight gallons that we accumulated. All right, so net change. This is a huge, huge idea. We're going to be talking lots about net change over the next couple days and tons about net change while we're studying for the AP test. All right, so one last little formula we're going to set up. This right here, this quantity, is equal to this. Okay, now let me show you why. Just in parentheses, I'm going to show you why it ends up equal to this. Remember the way the first fundamental theorem works is we take the antiderivative of this. Now remember the antiderivative is s of t. And we want to take it from t1 to t2. And so that's how we end up with this. We plug the upper bound into the antiderivative. Then we plug the lower bound into the antiderivative. Okay, so just to show you, this quantity right here is in fact equal to this quantity right here, and the first fundamental theorem kind of connects them together. Okay, so this is a lot of kind of theoretical stuff. Um, hopefully the concepts make sense to you, and we're going to talk more about the concepts when we have class and we're able to go over some of these. Um, the examples, I think, will really help make sense out of this. Okay, so example one. A survey shows that a mayoral candidate is gaining votes at a rate of, and then it gives us our function, T is the number of days. How many supporters will the candidate have after 60 days, assuming she had no supporters at T equals zero? All right, so that helps us to find the net change. That initial value actually is important. So here's what we're going to set up. And let me write, actually, I'm going to write a very important sentence here that will help us through all of these problems. To get a total amount. To get a total amount like the total amount of water in a bucket you integrate the rates. Like I said, that is a huge idea that the AP test will absolutely cover at some point. Okay, so if we're trying to get the total amount of supporters, we have to integrate the rate of supporters. And this is the rate at which she's gaining supporters, so we're going to integrate that function. So integral from, we'll talk about the bounds in a second, have a dt, since everything is in terms of t, and then it says after 60 days. So we're assuming that we're starting at zero, and then we're going up to the 60th day. So that's the setup that we're going to be using. So we're integrating the rates, we're integrating the rate at which she's gaining supporters, and then that'll give us the total amount of supporters that she has after 60 days. Okay, so we get to use the first fundamental theorem here. Antiderivative of this is 1,000t squared, and then plus 1,000t. We evaluate it from 0 to 60. So first we're going to plug in the 60. So 1,000 and then times 60 squared plus 1,000 times 60. And then minus, this is just 0, 0 plus 0. Okay, let me technically put parentheses around there. Okay, so 60 squared is 3,600. All right, so 3,600, then we multiply that by 1,000. Okay, and then plus 60,000, and then of course minus zero. So we add this all up and we get 3,660,000 uh, supporters. You always want to include units with these. All right, so that is the net change in supporters from zero to 60 based on the rate at which she's gaining supporters. All right, so again, big idea. To get the total amount of supporters, you integrate the rate at which the supporters are changing. Okay, example two, very similar. Traffic flow rates. They will always mention the word rates, by the way. And when they show um, when they show something like this, they will usually give you the units, like votes per day. It'll be something per time unit. So here, even though they didn't say it in here, this is given by cars per hour. Or they say T is in hours, they throw that in there. All right, so if we want to know how many cars pass by in the time interval from 8 to 10, we do the integral from, now careful here, it's not 8 to 10, because they tell us that 8 a.m. is 0. It's from t equals 0 to 2 hours later, and then we throw in our traffic th flow rates.
Okay, and always have the DT. The AP test will take off points if you forget that DT at the end. Okay, so we do the fundamental theorem. Take the antiderivative. We get 3,000t plus 1,000t squared minus 100t cubed. And then we evaluate that from 0 to 2. Okay, so we're going to plug in the 2. So 3,000 times 2 is 6,000 plus 1,000 times 2 squared is 4,000, minus 1,000 times 2 cubed is 800, and then minus just 0. When I plug 0 in here, I get 0 for everything. So I end up with 10,000 and then minus 800. So I get 9,200. Always include units. It would just be cars. It's a terrible R. There we go. 9,200 cars pass by in this time interval. We got that by integrating the rate at which the cars were passing. All right, a couple more examples from the same section. So go ahead and flip it over. We're going to talk more specifically about the whole pos the particle motion, the position, velocity, and acceleration stuff. So we're using these same ideas to talk about displacement. And displacement is just the total amount of position change. I guess we could say that. So if you want to know the total amount of position change, you integrate the rate of change of position, which is velocity. Okay, so if we want to know displacement, we integrate velocity from t1 to t2. Okay, and what that gives us is, we can use the fundamental theorem to show this, the antiderivative of velocity is position from t1 to t2. And if we finish this off, we plug in the upper bound and then minus plug in the lower bound. So this is the change of position. It's the position at the second time value minus the position at the first time value, which is basically the definition of displacement. Okay, so that's how we get displacement is we integrate the velocity function. Say we wanted the actual distance traveled. Because remember displacement, if you're going backwards it counts as negative. If we're going forward it counts as positive. If you wanted to know how much distance was traveled regardless of what direction you were headed in, what you actually do is you take the antiderivative of the speed rather than the velocity. Okay, so you integrate the speed instead. And speed, which we defined multiple chapters ago, is the absolute value of velocity. Okay. So we're going to keep that idea in this example three. Notice we've got lots of space here because we're going to find first displacement and then total distance traveled. Okay, so here's our velocity function. We want from zero to four pi. So for displacement, displacement is pretty straightforward. All you do is you set up the integral from zero to four pi of whatever our velocity function is, which is cosine. Okay, so just do a little fundamental theorem. We take the antiderivative of cosine, which is sine, and then we evaluate that function from 0 to 4 pi. So first I plug in my upper bound, minus, oops, that should be a pi. Then I plug in my lower bound. So sine of 4 pi. 4 pi is in the same place as 2 pi in the circle, which is the same place as 0 on the circle. And the sine of 0 is 0. Okay, so this is no displacement, which basically means that as my particle runs its course, it's going to land in the same place that it left off. Okay, so its displacement is zero meters. So even include the unit there. Okay, so I want to show you the picture. I want to show you why that worked out the way it did. Okay, so up to one, down to negative one. This is our time. So let's go pi, two pi, three pi, four pi. Okay, so cosine function starts up at the top, and it goes down, hits its low point, goes up, finishes a cycle right here, and then it's going to go down, low point, come back up, and finish another cycle right here. Okay, so from 0 to 4 pi, that's two full cycles of cosine. Okay, so my positive area, I've got a bump here, half a bump here, and a full bump here. So I have full bump, two half bumps that are going to cancel out with these lower bumps here. Basically, the positive area and the negative area balance each other out ends up giving us a displacement of zero. However, in part B, when we want total distance traveled, because even if they're going backwards, they're still getting distance. I mean, like picture if you were running back and forth, even though your displacement is zero, you still ran something. So if we want to do the total distance traveled, we're going to set up a very similar integral, except we're going to do the absolute value of cosine. Okay, so 
Using that picture that I left up there, I want to talk about the absolute value. So absolute value means any of the pieces of the graph that are below the x-axis get bumped up above the x-axis. So for absolute value, this is the area that we're calculating here. So we saw one of these examples with absolute value where the pieces that were down below the x-axis, we integrated them up above the x-axis. Okay, So let me walk you through how we're going to set this up. The integral from 0 to pi over 2, that's this part right here, it's just normal cosine the cosine that we drew originally, plus then this next piece from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, this is negative cosine, the opposite of cosine, because original cosine is down below the x-axis, so negative cosine would bump it back above. All right, and then next we go from 3 pi over 2, which is this spot right here, to 5 pi over 2, and that's back to original cosine. Plus, and the next piece goes from 5 pi over 2 to 7 pi over 2. And that's back to being the opposite of cosine, because original cosine is down below, so we flip it up above. And then finally, we go from 7 pi over 2 to 4 pi, and that is back to original cosine. All right, so that's the setup. Okay. The way that the setup works, and we know how cosine is, I mean, it, it, it's periodic. It follows the exact same pattern over and over again. So rather than doing the antiderivative five different times, plugging in the upper bound, plugging in the lower bound, what we're basically going to do is I want us to focus on just one of these areas. I mean, we can pick like this one right here. There are four of these. We've got this area. We've got an identical one here, here, and then two halves of one right here. So I'm going to turn this into 4 times, and then that's this middle piece here, from 3 pi over 2 to 5 pi over 2. Okay, the fact that sine is a periodic symmetrical function allows me to do this. Because again, this area right here is repeated right here, it's repeated right here, and then if I add these two pieces together, it would be repeated right there as well. So I'm just going to do it once, and then multiply it by 4, and I'll have the whole thing covered. Okay, so 4 times... And then I take the antiderivative of cosine, which is sine, and run it from 3 pi over 2 to 5 pi over 2. All right, so I can either keep the 4 out front, or I can keep the 4 with it. doesn't really affect my answer. So 4 times the sine of 5 pi over 2, and then minus 4 times the sine of 3 pi over 2. All right, so first of all, 5 pi over 2 is in the same spot as pi over 2, and the sine of pi over 2 is 1. And then minus 3 pi over 2, that value is negative 1. Okay, so we've got 4 minus negative 4, which gives me 8. Okay, so the total distance traveled would be 8 meters. Very different from the displacement. Okay, so last example we're going to look at here is a table example. And we are going to be using some Riemann sums for this last one. So it gives us the rate at which water is draining from a tank. Here are all those values here, and it's given at half minute intervals. Okay, so this is given in minutes, and then these are liters per minute. So we want to compute the average of the left and the right, which is kind of like a midpoint. Um, so I'm going to show you what we're going to do here. So we're going to average out the left and right values. So for each one of these, we're going to take the average of the left and the right, which is not the midpoint. Okay, it's not the midpoint, because I don't know what the value is at 0.25. Doing the midpoint would be making assumptions. Averaging the left and right out is not making any assumptions. So I start with this first rectangle. The width of the rectangle is 0.5. The average of the left and right values would be halfway in between, and so we use 49. Plus, this next rectangle also has a width of 0.5, and then I average these two out, so I use 47 liters per minute. Plus, then from 1 to 1.5, I have a width of 0.5. And for my rate, I average these two out, which is 45, plus another one has a width of 0.5, and I average these two values out, and I use 43, plus from 2 to 2.5, that rectangle has another width of 0.5, and then I average these values out to 41, plus, and one last one, again, has a width of 0.5, and I average these values out to get 39. So every single one of these values, we're multiplying minutes 
times liters per minute. So I know for sure that I'm going to end up with some number of liters. All right, that's going to be the total change in water, the total amount of water that has drained out of the tank. Okay, and then I just multiply this in, plug it into a calculator. I'm going to give you the answer and hope that you can just take my word for it. We end up with 132 liters when we plug all of these values in. All right, so what that says is during the first three minutes, a total of 132 liters drained out of that tank, which you can estimate just kind of based on these rates. All right, so like I said, huge, huge, huge AP topic. We're going to spend a whole day um, in our next class going over these AP problems that you would see on the AP test. All right.